Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Joan Didion said we tell each other stories in order to live. Sometimes those stories are what makes the world go round. In business, it's the origin stories of companies that often define their success or failure. In Silicon Valley, of course, those stories are essential. Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm room, Larry and Sergey dropping out of Stanford, Hewlett and Packard in a garage, and Jobs and Wozniak in their computer club. Usually part myth, part apocryphal, these stories often come to define the culture and sometimes the product of the companies themselves. What they always do is reflect the dreams and perceptions of the founders. The business of news and media is no different. The founders of our great news brands all have a story to tell. In the modern era, the story of Ted Turner and CNN is perhaps a penultimate example. But another powerful story is the founding visions of national public radio and the extraordinary women who gave it life. These women didn't invent it any more than many tech founders invented their technology. But what they did is to give it shape, life, and a reason for being, and in so doing, assured its growth and survival. These women, Susan Stamberg, Linda Wertheimer, Nina Totenberg, and Cokie Roberts, are the subject of a new joint biography by my guest, Lisa Napoli. Lisa has previously written about the founding of CNN in her book, Up All Night, and she has a long career in journalism, working for Marketplace, The New York Times, and MSNBC. It is my pleasure to welcome Lisa Napoli back to this program to talk about her new book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. Lisa Napoli, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. Before we get into the story of these women, the story of your work, you've written about this little radio station in Bhutan, about essentially the money that kept NPR afloat for a long time, the founding of CNN, and now that this early startup period of NPR. Talk about the themes that have been consistent and, and the views of the media that run through your work. What a great question. You know, I think you can tell that I love reflecting on this industry in which I've spent so much of my life, but also about the impact of that industry on our society. It's so huge. For a long time, I was a technology reporter at the New York Times at the early stages of the web, and I was so entranced, um, enthralled by how the web, as it took over Mindshare, just changed the way we did everything. And that was back in the beginning before we really had a sense of it, only an imagination of it. And so I feel that way about all forms of media. Uh, And I look at technology as media too. And at this stage of my life and my career, rather than running around and doing a constant deadline, I love digging in and looking at the history because I think we can learn so much from it. And I find it so intriguing. And one of the things that's so unique about this story is is simply the idea of radio, which in many ways was kind of the original social network. Exactly. And it's so funny to think that radio was left for dead back in the wake of television ascent um, and and that public radio wasn't a fully formed entity the way you know it, it is today this huge corporation it's a nonprofit corporation and it's it's much more complicated than that because you have the member stations and you have the mothership NPR and their strange interesting uh, financial relationships but um, radio wasn't like that back then it was left for dead they called it the hidden medium actually back in the 60s and early 70s. And one of the things that's so amazing about the story you tell about these women is that, you know, we think of NPR as this monolithic institution today, but when these women in particular joined in the early 70s to start, it was a, it was truly like a startup today. I think I love startup stories, Jeff. I know I do. I went to a little college that, that was only 10 years old when I attended it. So I think this story I was drawn to for the same reason is looking at how it got to be this brand that uh, so many people, you know, has this cultish following. Um, and yes, what's so interesting, and it wouldn't be as interesting if it hadn't been the case, is that these women arrived at the early Uh, early start of NPR as it was, as you said, becoming formed, which happened to run parallel to the women's movement, the second stage feminism of uh, the 1970s. And so 
a, it's a combustible moment in time. And it's because of that that this story is so interesting. Women didn't have jobs in broadcasting the way, you know, we take for granted that they do now. And the fact that they were able to forge their trails was partially because this place that hired them didn't have the, the ability to discriminate. Uh, they just needed people who worked, warm bodies. And the warm bodies happened to be ambitious, talented women who changed the course of, of the medium. One of the other aspects of this that's so interesting, and, and it's part of the startup story, and it's what makes it unique, I think, in some ways, is that they didn't just, even though they weren't the founders of NPR, they didn't just shape the product when they came in, but they also shaped the culture in the way that founders often do. Yes. Yes, and it is interesting, right, because they didn't have a, a stake in it financially the way a founder would or a CEO would, but they, they had a stake in making it an okay place to work for women because they were women and they had families. Um, not all of them had children, but they, they all had husbands and they, you know, wanted to have lives and did have lives. And so they saw in their colleagues this chance, and most of their colleagues were younger, um, even though they weren't particularly old, but they were sort of the grand doms, and they they set the course. They also said many times that they were ferociously insistent on creating an old girls network because they saw that the old boys network was in full force, especially in Washington D.C., where they all lived. And here they finally had a, a toehold into a workplace, and they were going to make their their old girls network happened because they had the they had the power finally to do so they felt like you know some people would think oh well i've got mine i don't need to share or help anybody else but they didn't think that at all they they worked as a unit both professionally and personally and uh with each other and with other women outside that that uh network to make sure that that people could flourish and 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 build that network how much of this story is about the chemistry as it evolved between these four women? Had there been a different player involved or had one of them not been there, how would the story be different or would it? We probably wouldn't have written the book. It's, you know, it's such an interesting thing. It's a kismet thing. We all feel it. You know, you feel it when you fall in love. You feel it when you make a friend at a workplace who becomes a lifelong ally outside of the workplace. And this was just a really wonderful example of four women coming together at this moment in time, that combustible moment in time, who happened also to really like one another enough to carry it out of the workplace and, and help each other with their kids or their husbands when they were ill or, you know, their, their personal matters too. And that's not something that happens like this terribly often. I mean, hopefully we all have it at least once, although now more than ever, of course, workplace, that's a strange concept <laughs> that you go somewhere. But they um, they did go somewhere every day to this ragtag place as it, it was evolving. And they were just committed to supporting and helping each other. And they recognized that in doing that, it made their work stronger. If Koki had to run off and do something related to her kids, Linda, who didn't have kids, you know, was happy to cover for her uh, on the Hill. And they also recognized that both Linda and Koki, since they were such a team in covering politics, that, that there was so much to go around that competing with each other really wasn't the point. They could support each other and enhance what they were doing and in so doing, enhance what they were offering to the network. Talk about the specific talents that each of them brought to, to their work. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Susan Stamberg, if people remember back when she was the star of the show, was, was unparalleled in broadcasting at the time. She really set the tone of NPR. NPR, if it had fallen into you know, someone else's hands or voice, would have uh, sounded more like commercial radio. But she was, she was really a person before she was a journalist. And she brought this humanity and this warmth to her and, and curiosity and quirkiness. Uh, I love the story about how when Jimmy Carter was arriving on the scene before he became elected president, she didn't want to interview him, the candidate. She wanted to interview his dentist about his teeth, which people may remember were quite 
fabulous. And in so doing, she was able to illuminate a part of his personality because apparently he was very attentive to his teeth, according to his dentist. And so that sort of quirky side way into a story is what I think a lot of people like and appreciate about NPR. Some people hate it too, but there, it, it created a sound for the place. Uh, as it was trying to find its own identity. Whereas the other three women, Linda and Susan, I mean, sorry, Linda and Nina and Koki were more hard-nosed reporters. They liked going out on the hill, fanning out around D.C., um, and and finding stories uh, that were inside the Beltway stories, but finding a way to tell them so that they related to other people. They all said that, um, you know, at the time, it was just men covering politics, covering the legal affairs. And when you had a woman wielding the microphone, you had a different point of view. That's the whole point of diversity. So women were asking questions of lawmakers and justices in ways that they never had been asked before, which changed both the perception of women uh, as as capable of talking about these matters, which was not the case before, but also changed women's perceptions of themselves because women weren't routinely included in discussions about politics and, and, and weighty matters uh, before they became reflected on the air and seen as, as capable of having those conversations. It's so clear to see all of this as you write about it in the book and in, in the rearview mirror. To what extent were they aware of how they were changing the culture as well as they were doing their jobs at the time? I don't, I think they knew that it was a big deal because they'd struggled so much in their early careers to get jobs that they had this opportunity uh, to, to be behind the microphone. But I, I don't think they were conscious of it on a day-to-day uh, basis. As Susan, though, did receive fan mail from people, which she meticulously cataloged and is available in a research library in Maryland. And so when you look through that fan mail, you really get a sense of, and she must have gotten it too, as she was receiving it, of how important she was to people, how intimate the medium of radio was, and how it fanned out around the country at a way in the 70s before we were used to uh, this kind of attention from the media. I mean, in Kansas, there might not have been the New York Times a local version of the New York Times, but you had Susan Sandberg wafting in on the airwaves and and elevating the dialogue nationally in a way no one had before. So they knew that they were doing something that they loved and that it was exciting. But I think it's only in the aftermath, which is why, you know, I, this is an unauthorized book, but I, and the women were helpful to me as I asked them questions along the way, but it wasn't their book. And they would say that too. But now that the book is out, it's delightful to hear them say how much they love it because as we get older, the benefit of time, we realize, boy, that was, an amazing period. And I knew it was amazing while I was living it. But now only decades later, do I really have a palpable sense of how exciting and, you know, tone setting what we did was. In many ways, they were competing not with radio, but they were competing with the evening news broadcasts of the day. That's a really excellent point. Yes. And that's the other thing I tried to draw in this book and my last book, too. It, you know, people like us remember what it used to be like before 24 seven, everything. But I really wanted to remind people about that. And also I wanted to show younger people who weren't around for it that there never used to be this uh, cacophony of voices that we have uh, available to us all the time in every medium presenting information about very specific subjects and widespread subjects. When these women were coming up, NPR was coming up in a, in a world where there were just three networks giving news at dinner time. There was some radio news. It wasn't, it was rarely extensive and um, print was shifting and changing because of the impact of television, but it wasn't the, the chorus of voices that we have, right? Well, of course, it's wrong because it sounds like they're all together. They're not, <laughs> but, but uh, it, it wasn't this, this widespread array of options. And so that's what also was so exciting because the voices were louder than they traveled further because there were fewer places to hear news and information. Did they see themselves as as radio personalities as well as journalists? 
I, I, I don't think they did to start, certainly. I think they got a sense of it because of the reaction. Um, you know, I think it was Koki and Linda who used to say on Capitol Hill, anybody will talk to anybody if they're a Martian with uh, a microphone, you know, doesn't have, if you have a green head and tentacles coming out of it, you know, they, they keep any, any politician is going to talk to you. But what happened was, is they became better known and broke stories and, and proved themselves uh, as so capable and both analysts and journalists, I think that people reacted to them differently. And of course, what changed everything for Koki was when she got put on television and she became a television star. And that allowed her to become a uh, speaking star. She went on the circuit and that allowed her to write books. So her fame, she was really one of the first uh, multimedia cross-platform superstar brand journalist, which which created some controversy for her because back then that was seen as kind of bad taste. And now, of course, every journalist hopes for that kind of multi-platform success. But she was she was an innovator in that. She was it wasn't a calculated uh, a, attempt on her part. It was just basically organic that it grew her success grew. To what extent did that involve competition between these women? Well, shockingly. Um, you know, in, a, in another world, you would think that women would just snipe or people, not just women, <laughs> people would snipe at somebody because uh, I've seen plenty of men do it, too, uh, at somebody who was able to break out and have such huge success. But by all accounts, uh, especially among these women who are her dear friends, there was not envy. Uh, and that some people find that actually astonishing. I think there was a review where somebody said that about this book. Like, how is it possible? There had to have been back backstabbing. These women were so supportive. They were like the best uh, you'd hope for with a sister. They uh, and and Linda even said in a variety of articles at the time as Koki was becoming more popular, nobody would marvel at her success if she was a man, but because she's a mother and a wife and a successful journalist, people keep having to point that out. And I think they all were so bemused by what had happened for Koki, Koki herself, that, uh, because it was so natural for Koki, there was no, she had been born in D.C., grown up in D.C., uh, in the the political ecosystem. So there was nothing unusual about it for her. She just loved talking about it the way somebody likes talking about sports. And these women saw that, and uh, they all had their chances to do other things and did, did, were successful at it, too. Uh, so they really were a unit. They saw themselves as a unit. I mean, not at all to compare it to a military, but they, they, were, they were in a uh, moment in time together, and they never lost sight of the fact that they had started out with each other, they'd supported one another, they'd helped this network get on the ground, off the ground, and um, that that just never was lost on them. Did they feel their work was appreciated by the higher-ups as the network started to grow? Oh, yeah, they knew that they were essential to the network, and if the network tried to mess around, they made their their grievances known. Um, they absolutely knew their, their worth, their value. That's a great story for people in general, but women in particular. Uh, you know, not everybody is. is superstars like these women are in, in, in the media visibility way that they, they were. But um, they knew. They knew. And they also advocated on behalf of their employees. They were very worried as more shows were rolled out at NPR about the impact of the extra work on all of their lives. Um, they were active in the union that represented them, and they were ferocious in standing up for what they wanted and believed. And um, that's – it's also easy to say that, too, when you're, when you're super successful. But they knew. They knew from the management that it was clear that they were essential. As news moved into the realm of entertainment, as much as you've written about, particularly in, in Up All Night – how did they respond to that? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure I really know too much about that. They, you know, they, they just kept doing, Nina keeps doing what she's been doing for decades, which is covering the Supreme Court in a way that few people do. Uh, and in a way no one does. In her case, I mean, she's a singular force. I think that they're um, bemused by the, the 
poor Koki is no longer with us. But I think that they're bemused by the media ecosystem that we live in now. But they seem to try to stay pure to their roots and their beliefs. Um, I think, you know, Susan and Linda have said podcasting amuses them and they're really not interested in it. You don't have to be, you know, they're mostly retired. You know, they've got, they're, they're in a different world now. And like anybody who's a veteran of a world that's matured or devolved, as I like to say it has, into the world that it's in right now, I think they're just looking at it and appreciative to to be around. Um, but I haven't heard any harsh criticisms of it. More, more, mostly the amusement and the amusement at women who today come along and you know it doesn't even occur to them that yes, I will have a family, uh, whatever that looks like for you, and I will have a career, whatever that looks like for them. And it's of course I'm going to have everything. But you know their generation was not that way. When you talk to them today, how do they look back on, on radio in general at that time? What, what do they wish they maybe had done differently or might have been different then from, from, the, from the vantage point of today? I haven't heard anybody say anything like that or read or, or – no, I think that they are really aware of – how transitional radio was at that time and how transitional NPR was at that time because I write about how NPR almost didn't make it. And I think that they're fascinated to see what, what has become of it. But um, I haven't heard any regrets or, or musing about what might have been or what might have been different. Even if there's a bad time in the time I chronicle in this book in the early 80s that it almost all fell apart. They sort of don't even want to talk about it. They want to hold ahead and focus on the fact that it's so intelligibly important now. How much were they aware of or, or, or tried to help or, or distance themselves from some of those financial problems that almost took down NPR in the 80s? Well, that was the other interesting thing is, you know, I kept trying to think in, in another workplace, if you saw a problem, how much would somebody really step up and try to save the company that you were working for. In this case, they did. They, uh, they went to that publicly in order that, you know, they felt it was a public trust that was worth supporting and saving when NPR was on this precar- precarious financial ground. And they were very public about trying to rally support. Uh, to help save it because they knew that by then, by the early 80s, after 10 years, they knew that this was an essential service that was beloved. They loved their jobs and they didn't want to see the place blow up and it almost did. And how did they participate in, in this project? Talk a little bit about that and, and reminisce about those those many days. Well, I don't want to give away the whole story, but there was this pre- precarious financial moment in the 80s that almost did uh, NPR in, and the women were just ardent about uh, doing what they could to help right the sinking ship that was NPR at that moment in time. And that was sort of the pivot point drama of the story. I, I struggled when I started. I knew there was no way I was going to, on the 50th anniversary of NPR, tell the entire story of NPR of the last 50 years. There was no way. And there was no way I could tell a comprehensive story about the women's careers um, in the time that I had to write this book. I wanted to look, I wanted to really zero in on how they became these, these estimable women, these, these iconic voices for so many people, the root of NPR's success. And the drama in this book is of the, how it almost fell apart. So that's really what I zeroed in on. In this book, it really was, let's remember a time when FM radio was a fringy, marginalized thing, and when educational radio stations were little tiny stations licensed to universities just as playthings. Um, that's what I really wanted to hearken back to. Oh, and that women didn't always have the voice or the rights in a workplace to move up the, the corporate ladder and uh, get their due. That, was, that wasn't very long ago where that was not the case. And finally, do they feel good about knowing they are the founding mothers of NPR? Do they embrace that? They call themselves that. It was Susan who, who made up the name. 
And uh, I think Nina apparently, you know, that's silly. You know, I'm not a mother. And it's stuck among people at NPR, uh, for sure, people do them that way. But no, Susan was, was pretty passionate about making sure that they get their due as the founding mothers. And of course, it's cheeky and funny, and some people think it's a little retro to call them that. But uh, hey, it's not by accident that Kofi Roberts were talking about the founding mothers of the United States. So uh, it's kind of uh, an interesting full circle. Lisa Napoli, the book is Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. Lisa, it's always a pleasure. I thank you so much for spending time with us. I look forward to writing another book and coming back soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you.